Hello, everyone. Welcome to the sermon for this week. Uh, we are finishing off our series on the Beatitudes uh, this morning, so I hope that uh, you have been able to uh, follow along with everything that's going on in this sermon series. If not, uh, go onto our channel and you can look up all the sermons from not only this ser series, but all of the other series for the past number of years. They're all there. You can go back and listen uh, to any of them for maybe the first time or maybe second, third, or fourth time if you want to remind yourself of what's been talked about. Um, I, if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to like the video and to subscribe to the channel. Uh, that's a perfect way for you to uh, know what's going on at the church and to also get some uplifting words uh, through our sermons, Bible studies, and everything else that's get, that gets put here on our YouTube channel. I uh, hope that you are having a wonderful week. Let's dive into the scripture that we have uh, for this morning. Our scripture comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 11, verses 25 through 36. Here are the words of the gospel. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not come, yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up and quickly go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we have this opportunity and this medium to be able to worship and to glorify your name and to learn a little bit more about what it means to be your followers. Father, we pray that you would send your spirit upon all who listen to this message, no matter where they might be, no matter what time it might be, that you would send your spirit upon them, break open their ears and their hearts so that we might be one with you and we might hear the words that you have for us as your believers and followers. We pray all of this in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. All right, so as I said before, we are finishing our series today by looking at the Beatitudes of Christ from the Sermon on the Mount, and we've spent time on each of the Beatitudes, and hopefully you've found areas in your own discipleship and in your own faith journey that are in need of growth, because as I've said every single sermon, and I will say it again this sermon, all of these traits are meant to be embodied by all disciples. Every follower of Christ should desire at all times to know their spiritual poverty, to crave God above all things, to be humble, to set their aim on God, to be merciful at all times, and to promote peace at all times. Each of these are essential to being a blessed follower of Christ. And last week, we started into the first of two Beatitudes that don't necessarily fit. And I say they don't necessarily fit because neither last week's Beatitude nor the one that we're going to talk about this week are going to be always present in our lives. Whereas all of those other Beatitudes are ones that we should have as part of our character makeup at all times. These two Beatitudes come and go. Last week, we talked about how being a follower of Christ places a target on our backs, not only for Satan himself, but for his dominion and his followers. While God will eventually take back what was always his to begin with, for now, we know that Satan is the ruler of the earth. 
Jesus makes no bones about this when he tells us that in order to become his disciple, we must pick up our cross and follow pick up the instrument of pain, death, and torture, pain, torture, and death. Let's put it in the right order, right? Pain, torture, and death. Persecution is going to be a part of our faith journey. And if you've never been persecuted in your faith journey, then my question is, have you really been living out your faith? Because if you've really been living out your faith, you will have been persecuted at one point in time or another. Now, as I said last week, it does not have to be physical pain, torture, or even the threat or immediacy of death at your doorstep for it to be persecution. But for all those who live their faiths, they will be persecuted, and persecution will come to all those who claim Christ as their own. And the blessing attached here is important because every martyr proves it throughout the history of the church. When we are persecuted here, we are setting up for ourselves a mansion in eternity. That is the blessing, that we will attain eternity through our suffering and persecution here, namely by the fact that we cling to God and to our faith. Now, while persecution is something that every Christian will experience, I wanted to finish our series out looking at the beatitude that is common to all of humankind, whether they're Christian or not, whether they're Jewish or not. It doesn't matter what their creed is. It doesn't matter anything else. If they are a human being, they will experience this last beatitude. Every person on this earth will have a chance many times over to mourn. Now, I know that that may have sounded a little weird in the way that I put it, but I said it purposefully, that we will have the chance to mourn. And I said it particularly that way because the beatitude we are going to be talking about and the blessing is, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, don't get me wrong here. There is no blessing in being miserable, and there is no blessing in being unhappy. Yet, yeah. what else is it to mourn the loss of a loved one, you would ask? The death of a friendship, the ending of a beloved career, or any source of mourning in this world? What is it? What else would we be talking about? Isn't mourning just another form of being unhappy, of living in misery? If you were to ask the widow, they would tell you the same. But it's only misery if we see it as the end, right? If we see that as being the true end. But for us as Christians, in light of the empty tomb, is anything on this earth ever really the end? Of course not. I hope that today's scripture lesson will prove not only Jesus' sermon and be a proof of that, but also prove to us that mourning, when done correctly, is a blessing to the one who is left behind. Now, I chose for this us this morning to remember that Christ mourned, all right? Almost everyone knows the story of Lazarus. The friend of Jesus, the brother of Mary and Martha, has died. Mary and Martha sent messengers to Jesus to warn him of Lazarus' plight, yet Jesus never shows up. You can understand both women's frustration, can't you? You can understand Martha's frustration. It's like if you had a great family friend, someone whom you had known, you had lived with, you had loved, you had walked with, who was a great surgeon. And when your sibling needed emergency surgery, you called them and said, you are the best one around. Come and save my brother, my sister, my child, my parent, whoever it is. And then they never show up. In the passage before what we read this morning, Martha gives Jesus an earful. And honestly, she has every right to do. Jesus purposefully didn't come immediately. He instead waits where he is 
This isn't a case of Jesus was halfway across the country from Lazarus and sprinted all the way and still, you know, missed it. It's not the fact that Jesus ran into traffic on his way <laughs> over to Bethany. It was the simple fact that Jesus made a conscious choice and said, nope, I'm exposed to be here more than I'm supposed to be there. And instead, and instead of coming immediately, he waits to the detriment of her brother, Lazarus. And you can, can't you imagine Martha? She is thinking in her mind, how many others has Jesus saved? How many strangers that had no notion of who Christ was were healed by his touch? We even have a healing in the scriptures where Jesus goes and heals 10 people and only one comes back to worship God. The other nine just take the healing and go elsewhere. And Jesus doesn't take away their healing. Where is Jesus? Lazarus was a true believer and a dear friend. Martha is ticked and she has every right to be. She holds nothing back and she goes after Jesus. But I love how Jesus responds to her. Does he get mad at Martha for speaking to him like this? Let, let's just go to the basic fact here. The mere fact that she is a woman in this time period should have prevented her from speaking to Jesus like she did. But in fact, not on top of that aspect, on top of the societal aspect, this is a woman speaking to a rabbi, and let's even just go even one step further to where, G, where, where Martha uh, says, you are the son of God. This is a mortal woman speaking to the son of God in this way. At some level, this is blasphemous, right? This is horrible. But Jesus, all he does is he takes everything and he simply reminds her of who he is. He says all of that, and he goes, do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe in me, Martha? Can't you hear that first part of the scripture lesson that we read this morning? Can't you hear it in that soft and loving, comforting tone of Christ? Jesus isn't mad. He isn't upset. He understands. He knows. And this is the best part, because Jesus doesn't know because he's God. That's not the reason that Jesus knows. That's not the way I, that's not the reason I tell you that Jesus understands Martha's position. Jesus understands Martha's position and knows how Martha's feeling because Jesus is feeling the same thing. We worship a savior who is both human and divine together, not just divine, not just human, but a mixture of the two, a perfect mixture of the two. And while Christ, the divine part of Jesus, followed the will of God, which told him to stay away from Bethany, which told him you are where you're supposed to be. Don't go to Bethany. Don't go heal Lazarus right now. You need to be here. Christ obeyed God's will, but I guarantee you, even though it's not in the scriptures, this is reading between the lines, the man, Jesus, was angry about it. Jesus, the man, loved Lazarus was befriended by Lazarus, was a friend of Lazarus's. Christ followed the will of God, stayed gone too long to save the man Lazarus, but the human part of Jesus wept for the death of his friend. I would almost bet that if we could see the manuscript inside Christ's head in the gospel lesson, it would probably seem a lot like what Martha, the discussion between Martha and Jesus, because the, the man Jesus can't understand why the God Christ made him stay. Now, for me, there are no better passages in the gospels than when we get to see the humanness of Christ, because it proves over and over and over again that God gets us. 
not just because he's God and because he created us and because he's more powerful and wise and all that other kind of stuff. He gets us because he has literally felt everything that we feel. He has walked a mile in our shoes. When Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he says, follow me, not do it because I told you to. He's already carried it. He knows how hard it is, how painful it is, how heavy it is. But he proves to us that we can do it because he did it first. Now, I wanted to set all this up because I want us to understand that mourning is part of the human experience. Every single solitary person on the head that has ever walked this earth, bar none, literally, you've heard me say this a lot of times, bar none except Christ, right? But in this case, that doesn't apply. Every person on this earth will experience mourning. But how can mourning be a blessing? Where is God in the midst of mourning? Where is he? Where is he in the story? He's right in the middle, isn't he? God isn't just some deity who stands above and beyond and looks down and says, stop your crying, mortal, for eternity is much longer than this. You should just be glad, right? You should just be glad about eternity in the future. No, Christ is right there in the middle of the mourners, crying alongside them experiencing and feeling it every second. And that's why I can't tell you how many times I am so upset and angry and sad when I hear people get on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and all these other places, pastors getting up on a pulpit and telling people in their congregations and telling people throughout the world that this natural disaster happened because those people were sinners or that this illness was sent by God. I know that to be false testimony. Our God sits with those who mourns and mourns with them. Remember what I said blessing means? It means closeness with God. The blessing of the beatitude should tell us this as well, shouldn't it? The blessing doesn't say that their sorrow will be numbed or dulled or gotten rid of or that, heaven forbid, they would never experience to begin with. It says, for they shall be comforted in their mourning. God will place his arms around them and embrace them. He will weep with them. He understands their tears. He will accept their yells and their anger. He will never turn away. He will walk with us and continue to come closer in our times of deepest sorrow. You want to see our God in action? Read the passage again of Lazarus. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He wept. And even the people around him see how he loved Lazarus. If you hear this message and you are in that time of mourning right now, it's okay. Not because you will get out of it. Not because there's a better future ahead of you. No. You're okay right now. Because God is close to you. He, is, he has already come to you. He is embracing you. He understands you. And he will and is comforting you. The blessing isn't the replacement or the elimination of sorrow. The blessing is the closeness with our Savior and our Creator that this event that you are experiencing right now has produced. Now, can we all start to understand what Christ means when he says, blessed are those who mourn. Not those who have mourned. Blessed are those who are mourning right now. 
for God is with them bringing comfort. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I know that there are people listening to this that are in mourning. They have lost a loved one, a job, a career, so many things in this world that we can mourn over and are right to mourn over. Let your spirit be embodied in them. Let them see and feel your presence. Let them be able to speak their hearts and their minds to you, regardless of if it's in anger or not. And prove to them over and over again that not only do you understand because you have walked in those shoes, but that you are the only one that can bring comfort. And for those of us that are not experiencing mourning right now, let us internalize this message so that when that time comes, when that sorrow comes, we can seek your spirit out. We can immediately receive the blessing that was promised so that we might feel the closeness with you. And even in the midst of our sorrows, feel the joy that comes with being close to our creator. We pray all of this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I hope that this word brings you comfort, joy, and help through your neck through you this next week. I pray that we will see you either back here on our YouTube channel next Sunday for our message or in our sanctuary for our 1045 worship service. I hope that you have a healthy and a safe week. And may God continue to bless you.